Hi, I'm Dan Jones. Welcome to Interchange. Thanks so much for joining us. Three things to talk about in the next half hour. The life and death of Ted Kennedy, the life and possible death of Mercury Marine and Fond du Lac, and the proposal by a state lawmaker that all Wisconsin bartenders should be required to maintain complete sobriety during all work hours. A man who had to endure incredible pain and loss in his lifetime, absolutely. I'm not sure he deserves a nonstop adulation, though. The greatest senator of our lifetime? I'm not sure about that. Was he really so much more than an incredibly rich kid who went on to build a political legacy by acting like he was a fighter for the poor and underprivileged? I don't think he acted like it. I think he was a fighter for the poor and the underprivileged. That, that, is, that to me is, um, I guess it's what the Kennedy legacy and the Kennedy era represents to me because you're absolutely right. They were privileged people. They were absolutely royalty in this country. Uh, and the, and the, the, the sons, the, the boys, Joseph, who we never really then, you know, we've seen rich people involved in politics in recent years. Uh, and guess what their political interests are? Uh, cutting their own taxes, uh, getting no-bid contracts for the companies they used to work for, like Halliburton. Uh, you know, it's, there's just so much more selfishness instead of selflessness in politics these days. Um, and it all seems to be about, you know, what can I get for me? How much more can I get for me? Especially if, if we're talking about people coming from great wealth. And, and I, I understand, I have, I have, I've been very amused this week hearing, you know, just what a great, you know, across the aisle, uh, loved by Republic, you know, they're going to take all your wealth and, uh, you know, it, he, obviously he was well liked in the Senate, I think for all the obvious reasons, his personality and, and just that he was an outgoing, gregarious guy who, uh, you know, didn't hold, harbor any hard feelings between people. And, and let's face it, when I've heard Orrin Hatch talk this week about what great friends they were, it was clear they were drinking buddies is, is what they were. And, and they just spent a lot of time, uh, you know, with each other. Uh, ideology aside, he was an outgoing, friendly Irishman. I remember when his career started, he was considered the least of the Kennedys have a long career in which he was able to accomplish a whole lot for those much less fortunate than, than himself. You know, I, I know some people will be alarmed when I say this, but I, but I, I do believe if you ask the Kopechny family, they aren't going to say he was this great human being. Well, I think you have to. Uh, you if, have to. You have to if you are discussing the life, the history, the legacy, the dynasty of the Kennedys, and this particular Kennedy, that is a that is a chapter that cannot, cannot be ignored. Um, uh, be, I will address that shortly, but uh, uh, as a conservative, I still have some admiration and respect for his skills. Uh, well, well, and and his uh, that they're showing. Uh, I mean, his impassioned pleas on the floor of the Senate, pounding his fist and yelling and screaming, kind of reminds me of someone on this program. Uh, and I, I and you do have <laughs> to admire that. <laughs> However, um, you do have this mass adulation by the media this week without a mere mention of Mary Jo Kopechny. Two, two or three weeks ago, it was the 40th anniversary of his death. The media ignored it then, they're ignoring it now. And I believe that that incident in his personal life will forever tarnish and mar his overall legacy. I believe he always was in the shadow of his, and actually, he wasn't even politically like them. JFK was actually more to the right than than uh, than Teddy was cutting capital gains taxes, building up the war effort in Vietnam, uh, growing uh, defense spending. Those are things that Teddy Kennedy would have never grasped or or or, or, or fought for. Uh, and I think because of because of Chappaquiddick, because of some of the personal things that transpired in Teddy Kennedy's life, that will forever mar his legacy and will not make the effort in Congress right now to get this. Uh, uh, health care reform package passed in his name, a slam dunk. I, I, I have a hard time. This is not a slam dunk. Look at that as, you know, this is a terrible person. This is a human being flawed like we all are. Uh, and there was, uh, a, a, it was a horrible incident. It was a tragedy uh, in, in many ways. Uh, it, but I also have to say that knowing other people, you know, and, and having myself, uh, had experience with alcohol, anyone who confronts their alcohol problems and deals with them and then goes on to, uh, to be, have lead a long and productive life, uh, you may think that he was the least of the Kennedys, but, but in fact, 
both, even though John F. Kennedy was elected president of the United States, his, his presidency was he actually had to produce, and he did produce during, during his lifetime. And, and uh, you know, I think we're all better off for it because he, he protected and expanded things like children's health care and, and, uh, and, and kept this country from turning its back on Social Security and, and those programs for those unfortunate. Uh, at a time when there was a lot of political greed and a lot of political, uh, you know, antagonism toward the New Deal legacy. Uh, and he helped protect that during his lifetime. Well, now you have, though, this push, this, this sense among liberals in Congress that uh, there's a mandate that somehow, because of what has happened this week... ...be responsible for his political career that kept it on, on the radar all these years. He, has fought, he fought for it so long. I understand the sympathy towards, uh, you know, naming in his honor, but that's not the reason to pass it. The reason to pass it right. is we got to do it. we well, got to do it or, uh, you know, we're all going to be left without health insurance because our employers aren't going to be able to afford it. And, and you can't go to conservatives in Congress and say, well, pass this in Teddy Kennedy's honor. You can't ask conservatives to give up their principles because in honor of a man who would never give up his principles. That, that doesn't make any sense. All right. Next topic. What a fascinating battle going on between the union folks at Mercury Marine and Fond du Lac. What do they possibly have to accomplish by saying, no, you can't have another, you can't have another vote? How about the stubborn management mentality of, of taking taking jobs out of town. What are you talking about? Uh, it was overwhelmingly voted down, as, as of course it should have been. We don't and, know that. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, we do. We don't. Uh, and, and, you know, the idea that, you know, some company union people uh, would say, let's have another vote. Uh, anyone who would vote for a seven-year wage freeze uh, heading into, you know, the economic you know, just barely climbing out of a, of, of a depression that we're doing now, uh, that is insane to agree, and especially in this economy, unions all over America have agreed to cutbacks, have agreed to giving back on, on uh, health care, all kinds of givebacks they're doing, but you got to give them something. You can don't just threaten them and bully them and, 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 and threaten, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, leave this town a ghost town unless you do exactly what we say. That's not labor negotiations. Uh, and you, you can absolutely go back to the table and negotiate with this union, but you can't just kick them in the teeth again and say, hey, we're not going to give you anything. You just got to do it our way. When the option, I'm going to agree with Joel in just a minute here. When, go the, ahead. When, when the option is seven-year pay freeze, the negotiating table, you do not now given having, maybe being given a second chance, you don't kick yourself in the teeth again. Uh, now, we do not, now, Joel says they overwhelmingly turned down this, this god-awful offer. Uh, we don't know that uh, because the union management or the union uh, heads will not tell us what the vote was. If it was so one-sided, why don't they tell us? And I think there are some conscientious union members this week where the light bulb went on and said, you know what? They're serious. Mercury Marine is dead serious about getting out of town and taking the, these 1,900 jobs with them. We need to get back in and vote again and see if maybe some people had second thoughts. And they're trying their darndest. They're, they're standing outside the plant and trying to get signatures on a petition. And they're not, it's not being received all that well by some. I give them credit for sticking their necks out, not only for themselves, but for the city of Fond du Lac, which sta stands to lose quite a bit. Know that you can argue, and as I said last week, Joel, that maybe this company has not bargained in good faith and is being heavy-handed. That's, no kidding. that's true. You think? However, uh, the union members do not hold the cards. They had a chance to save their jobs, albeit under the not the most ideal conditions, and they voted it down, which is beyond me. Now you have another chance, possibly another chance, and you can't blow it this time because the company holds all the cards, and they're very serious about leaving. So, again... It's a no-brainer. You vote to save your own skin. And there are lots of people all over the state of Wisconsin who would die, would give their right arm to, have, to be in that position to say, I'll take that job. You know, I'll I, take I, the seven-year wage freeze. I, I do think a, a part of it could be that the company was going to move anyway and just wants to blame well, we the union. Know that, though. And just wants to blame the union. But they said, okay, this is what's going to take to keep us here. We'll offer it to them. And if they turn it down, then we will move. But still, why wouldn't you take it? Because a union is required by law to represent the interests of its members, uh, and 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 if you, you know, you do what Kevin says and said, you know, the company can do to us anything they want to, and we'll just take it. 
and believe me, believe me, the company will do it. Uh, companies will do that. Uh, but that's not labor negotiations, and that's not representing the interest of your employees. Ideally, it's not. Uh, the, the interest of, an, of your employees. You know, the, the whole system is both sides are supposed to be bargaining. And if only one side is, is trying to bargain and the other side is, no, no, this is our only offer and there's no bargaining, uh, that's not, that's not but, but collective the, bargaining. Union, that is not even following labor heads, law. Union heads are not listening to... Who knows, maybe it's a small percentage, but there is a faction within that union that says, look, uh, we think they're serious about moving. We want to have a second vote, and let's do it. And union management is not paying attention to those union members. Is that good representation? And I, I, think so. I wonder as well how much of it has to do with the international saying, okay, this is just one contract. We don't like this contract. Forget about Fond du Lac, because whatever contracts we agree to, then we have to use those as a template in other places around the country, so is the international just writing off you know, this bond? Unions, unions, they know the atmosphere they're bargaining in. Uh, you know, this is not. You know, they know they're not working from a position of strength here. But they have some some law on their side. They have some other tools on their side. If Mercury Marine really wants to abandon Fond du Lac, all those workers in that community who have worked for them all these years, and just say. Uh, you're nothing to us. Uh, uh, we're leaving. And they would have pulled uh, the plug they, a lot they, sooner than they, this. They are going to have to face other consequences of that, too, because you know, all over America, people are going to know what took place there. They're going to know what kind of people this company is. And there are some other tactics. I mean, there are some other tactics about boycotts and, and economic uh, consequences, as well as legal questions that they can raise uh, that, that, you know, the unions are not totally powerless either. They and, because presumably, you know, there's still labor law in this country uh, where you are required to bargain in good faith, and that's not what's going on in Fond du Lac. I, I think it's possible that the company will come back with another offer, and if they do, then I will buy Joel's argument that, yeah, this was a major chess game, and these were negotiating tactics. That's a risk I do not want to take, and I take the company uh, seriously when they say, look, it's either this or nothing. And again, we can argue whether or not that's bargaining right. in good faith or not and whether that makes them eligible for company of the year. Uh, that is a chance that I personally would not take. If they are saying it's this or we're on, on the next bus out of town to Oklahoma and you have a chance by voting yes to save your job and we'll stay here and then by doing so we have a chance to at least get back at the uh, negotiating t table and try to bargain something uh, more optimistic for ourselves. I, I do that. I do not cut off my nose to spite my face and say, oh, yeah, well, we don't like this offer. We're voting no. Uh, that really doesn't help the family put food on the table when those jobs are down in Oklahoma in another couple months. All right, next topic. Let's talk for just a few minutes about this proposal by a state lawmaker to require complete sobriety of all bartenders. If you're behind the bar, you can't let someone buy you a drink. <coughs> if you're behind the bar, you can't have a beer while you're talking to customers. I guess it's a well well intentioned idea, but I think it shows a complete lack of how the real real world operates because you know a few bartenders might drink too much and get out of control, but I don't think you punish all of them because of that. I, I think it's a it's a proposed solution without a problem. Uh, I'm not aware that uh, <laughs> bartenders drinking too much is is, is a major you know. Uh, social problem in, in in this state or any other state, uh, they got to remain clear-headed enough to count the change. You know, they they, they got to make sure nobody. Their tips. I mean, the, yeah, the, <laughs> the truth of the matter. Yeah, there are plenty of of problems associated with alcohol that need attention. Uh, not the least of which is uh, providing treatment upon demand for people who need it, uh, for people who have problems with alcohol, whether it's a bartender or a customer, or, uh, you know, and certainly anyone who gets behind the wheel of a car. But, uh, but you know, I, I think really where this is coming from is they know, these politicians, that the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel has been running a crusade on drunk driving, and the way to get in headlines is to propose something that has to do with alcohol and, you know, in this state. Uh, I, I, I do not even understand for sure what, what problem it is that this legislation is intended to address. Uh, I, I just, 
I, I you know, I've been in bars and I, I, I still go to bars even though I don't drink in bars anymore. And and I just don't see a lot of drunken bartenders that that are, a, are, are some kind of social problem we have to attack. You know, I, th I think he has a good he has a good point. He does there, there for are, change. <laughs> he actually does. There are so many times where you, you'll read some uh, article or a series of articles in the Journal Sentinel, and within a week, one of your cohort lawmakers will yeah. introduce a bill <laughs> to address my, co my cohort lawmakers. Will introduce a bill to address that well, problem. Well, yes, and they don't is, care where it goes after the headline. There is, sort of, the there is sort of a knee-jerk reaction to a high-profile headline in the legislature. There's no question about it. But that happens on both sides right. of the aisle. It, it, it does. And I the didn't say it. And this the, is, this no. is coming from the Democratic and, and side. And the, and the, yes, it is. Uh, the Journal Sentinel is on this crusade, where I think. If I didn't know any better, they would support the death penalty in these cases. The, the way they've been going at this, and again, they weren't the first. The Appleton Post Crescent, the Green Bay Press Gazette started their crusades before the Journal Sentinel said, well, hey, maybe we should jump on this bandwagon too. Um, that's part of it, but I think this particular bill, what's happening here is you have Josh Zepnick, who I know is, is, is a friend, a colleague, a Democrat from the south side of Milwaukee, who has lost a brother to, to a drunk driver. And so he has been on uh, his own personal crusade to not only get this bill passed, but many others. And sometimes you can get too involved. You can get it, it, you too, know, why, why it, the emotion that not, takes over. Why is that not mentioned in the articles? Because that would, when they talk about his proposal, because that would frame it in a different light for people. Yeah, and, and, and there, are, there, there are just an avalanche of bills that are starting to get hearings. We had to deal with the budget, so some of these other policy issues got put on the back burner. You're going to be hearing more about this. But there are so many proposals that do not address the problem, and this, with all due respect, Josh Zepnick, is one of them. Uh, there aren't, the, the drunken bartenders is not the problem. There aren't drunk bartenders. Maybe at the end of the night they will say, you know, hey, Dan, uh, you know, have a belt with me. And it's, uh, it's before they're on their way out. They work downtown. They can walk, maybe they can walk home or get a cab. They're not the ones out causing mayhem on the roads. And, and even, if, even if they were the problem, if we had this, this mass problem of drunk bartenders all across the state of Wisconsin, how is making, making them uh, conform to absolute sobriety going to prevent one drunk driving incident? I don't, I don't, I don't follow that. Yeah, man. And now, and now, where I work, you're going to see one, one piece of legislation after another, and you're going to have the Journal Sentinel and maybe others say, well, if you vote against this, well, you must be soft on crime or against, or, or, or you're, you're soft on drunk driving or don't understand or don't care, which isn't the thing. It, it's will some of these bills actually address the problem. I've sat in a room full of public defenders, prosecutors, judges, uh, uh, law enforcement, who all say that some of these things are only going to make things more expensive, uh, taking away the car, I mean, uh, taking away the car of a drunk driver. Were well, you going to penalize a whole family exactly. because of that? Yeah. And then, I mean, what's that person may go out and steal somebody else's car? You really have, I mean, it's one thing to put the face of a person who was maimed or killed in a drunk driving accident. Nobody, nobody s supports drunk driving. Uh, but but for the Journal Sentinel and others uh, to sort of paint this and and use this uh, to try and get every possible bill passed that won't make a hill of beans a difference is just wrong. It's just wrong. All right. Finally, before we go, a few more thoughts on the passing of a legendary political figure. Here's Rick Horowitz. Senator Edward M. Kennedy dead at 77. And thank goodness for that. Thank goodness for the at 77, that is. None of his three brothers, his three older brothers, made it to 70 or 60 or even 50. Who'd have predicted that the last of the boys would be the only one to receive the gift of years or that he'd put those years to such extraordinary use or that he'd find in the autumn of those years a peace that had eluded him or that he had eluded with such awful consequence in his own life for so long. Perhaps it was a new marriage. Perhaps it was the simple passage of time. Or perhaps it dawned on him at some point that they weren't coming after him. Not anymore, anyhow. There were years, in, entire decades, when I couldn't bear to watch Ted Kennedy on live television, especially not in close-ups. I needed to see the room. There was a hand somewhere with a gun somewhere, 
I knew it. We all knew it. I needed to see the room so that I could see the hand with the gun rise out of the crowd so that I could prepare myself or shout a futile warning to the screen or turn away a split second before the bullet struck. That's how we looked at Ted Kennedy, eyes half averted for so many years. Hard to fathom how he must have looked at himself. Even harder to fathom how he carried on with his life in the spotlight, in the crosshairs. Too much carrying on was one way he carried on, of course. He was frequently out of control, more caricature than senator, even as his legislative accomplishments mounted. He fought the good fights even as he fought the demons. And then, who knows why, the demons receded, retreated. The joy was still there, but now, too, there was a serenity at the core. Given the gift of years, he remade himself. He became the kind of person a Ted Kennedy could admire. When the end came, it came in his own home, in his own time, and still too soon. Thank you, Rick, and thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.